All right, John 21, our last chapter. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going to go out fishing, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they all went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. Well, the disciples went back to doing what they knew. They were fishermen, so they went fishing. Um, but it reminded me of when Jesus uh, called them, that he told them that they were no longer going to be fishers of fish, but fishers of men. Um, so they went out, they didn't catch anything. They were probably feeling exhausted, tired, irritable, frustrated, right? All the, the emotions that we would feel with empty nets. But early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they said. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Well, that scene reminded me, of course, of, of that miraculous catch that Jesus uh, gave them the, when he called them to follow him. But last time, remember, the net broke. This time, the net, uh, if you read on in John 21, the net did not break, overflowing with fish. The net stayed intact, right? And and it, it kind of, I think it's a, a, a representative of uh, the ministry that they were going to have, right? Remember when Jesus said in John 10 that he's the good shepherd? He said, I am the good shepherd. He said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. God purposed that none shall be lost. Um, and I, I think this miracle uh, sort of represents how we can choose to do life, right? If we choose to do the Christian life in our flesh, in our own efforts, trusting in ourself, right? We're going to come up empty, right? We're going to feel fruitless, right? We're going to have empty nets, right? But Jesus said, I chose you. I appointed you to bear fruit, fruit that will last. And apart from me, you can do nothing. So we know that, um, we know that Jesus had said that. And then we know that, uh, that, that the disciples were told they immediately obeyed, right? And they did it. Um, and, and with their obedience came great blessing, right? They had full nets. They had blessings uh, over and above uh, in abundance, right? And it's important to note that they did not recognize him until after they obeyed, which I think is, as we know, uh, in the Christian life, a lot of times um, that is what happens. Like we obey first and then God reveals himself. Um, and sometimes obedience is really hard. Sometimes it's difficult to obey. Sometimes we don't feel like obeying God, right? But we need to remember that success in the spiritual realm um, isn't always, doesn't always look like success in the physical. When I was a student at UConn, we brought this Christian illusionist in. I was a senior. I was in charge of publicity. And, um, and what he did was he did a big like magic show, but as he was performing these magic acts, he, um, he kind of explained some of them, how he did some of them and his whole thing, like he went, he traveled around the country and he, he, he disproved and he showed how people that claim to, uh, to do magic, uh, to read minds to um to talk to spirits like he kind of showed how that is all trickery like people learn these things like cold reading and then they play on people right um but his whole point was but jesus had no trickery like he really could read minds he really could his miracles were real and because his miracles were real uh everything he said was true and and it was such an amazing show it was fantastic and, 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 but as I looked around the auditorium during the show, I, I was very disappointed and sad because the auditorium was only half full. And I had envisioned, of course, you know, full auditorium, 
let's bring them again, you know, kind of, I had really high hopes and I was a little, I was very disappointed. I even kind of felt like a failure. But when I talked to my campus director, he was like, Lord, don't, don't feel bad. Like you, you never know what God is doing. You never know if the next Billy Graham is sitting in this auditorium and receive Christ for the first time, you know, for the first time, but <laughs> receive Christ. You never know. You never know what God's doing in the spiritual, the physical might, you know, your physical eyes sometimes can deceive you. So um, I think that was the beginning of my understanding and the shaping of the fact that you know, we have physical eyes, but that we also have spiritual vision, right? We've talked about that before. And sometimes our physical eyes do deceive us, right? But as we get more grounded in the word, right? The word is my lens. I see clearly uh, as I know the word and as, a, as, I'm, as the Holy Spirit, as I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, like Jesus talked about uh, last week, and I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, talk about it. I thought I was talking about it more this time, but, but, but he said, you know, we, we read that in the last chapter that um, the last time that um, Jesus breathed on the disciples, and then it was that Holy Spirit enlightening their mind, giving them spiritual understanding so they can understand the scriptures, right? So as we walk with Jesus, and as we allow the Holy Spirit to fill us, and, and, and we read the word and we have more spiritual understanding because the Holy Spirit's illuminating our minds, right? We see our lives the way God sees them and, and we experience more. We, we experience more uh, of God in our lives. We see our life through his eyes. We, um, we, we have more of a heart. Like we, 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 we learn to feel with God's heart and, um, and absorb God's um, values and his priorities um, and his purposes for us, which is wonderful. So, um, and then um, verse uh, seven, then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard this, it is the Lord. He wrapped his outer garment around him. The other disciples fought and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed him in the boat, towing the net full of fish. And they were not far from the shore, only about a hundred yards. But when they arrived, they when they landed, they saw a fire uh, with burning coals. There was fish on it and some bread. Well, um, the first thing, of course, that jumps out at me, no pun intended, was, you know, a Peter, like, just jumping out of the boat. Like, just that heart, you know, he just loved Jesus with so much love and his devotion to Jesus. I mean, he, it was only him and John that, that, that followed Jesus, you know, through the trials. We've seen this through his crucifixion to the cross. And then his Peter's devotion brought him to the tomb, the, 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 the empty tomb, right? So, so we know that, that he loves Jesus so much. But I, I immediately focused up on that, on that fire and, I, 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 and that coziness of the fire and the, the provisions that Jesus had uh, given. And, and I think that this set... It, it sets the stage for what Jesus was going to do in Peter's life and the disciples in the future. So in the rest of the chapter. So, um, so what I mean by that is that in the last time that Peter had um, been around, that we are told uh, when he was around the charcoal, right? He, he had denied Jesus, right? And I think this was uh, uh, fundamental in Jesus bringing healing to Peter that Peter uh, was going to have to replace those old memories, replace the tapes. You know, don't think about that anymore. Uh, but think about this. This moment was Peter was a moment that that Jesus was going to bring tremendous healing uh, in Peter's life to set him on agenda to move forward, fully forgiven, uh, re reconciled to Jesus, reinstated for the ministry that Jesus had as he's uh, realizes that, that new life in Christ. And so again, this, this picture of the fire and the coals and the bread and the fish on the fire, you know, this is a physical picture of a greater spiritual reality. Um, I immediately thought of Jesus and you'll remember John 14, where Jesus says, I go and prepare a place for you. I promise I will come back and make sure and bring you with me. Right? So Jesus promise that he's going to get us to heaven, right? That is a great promise. But as I, as I thought about the whole chapter, this is a spiritual, a greater spiritual, it's a spiritual, it's a physical picture of a greater spiritual reality, things that Jesus does in the spiritual realm. And this will help us. 
I think this helped the disciples um, to in their training for ministry, but also will help us as we join with Jesus in the works that he has for us. Well, what were Jesus' goals? Then when he, when he came to, to, to the earth, his goal was of his ministry was to seek and save the lost, right? And, and we know from John 17 that he uh, came to bring um, eternal life. And what is eternal life? Eternal life is to know God, our Heavenly Father, and Jesus the Son. Praise the Lord. And so um, what I saw, you know, and, and, and as, as, we, um, as you were able to do the homework, I had you um, look at the last um, section of each of the Gospels, right? Each of them have their own kind of take of the Great Commission, right? We tend to drill down on Matthew. Uh, Matthew 28 um, says, verse 18, all, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I'm sorry, my cat gets really needy when Nikki's not around. <laughs> That's Nikki's cat. Um, so, and then, so we are to, we are to go in Jesus's authority, right? We are to go, we are to preach, we are to baptize, we are um, to teach people to obey, right? And then that great promise, Jesus is always with us. He will never leave us. We know that one. We tend to know that one more than Mark. I don't know if you're able to read Mark this week, but Mark's gospel, at the end of Mark's gospel, Jesus said to them right before he ascended into heaven, he said, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And though these will be the signs accompanying those who believe, those who believe, all who believe. I, th I think it means all that believe. These will be the signs that accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. Um, they will pick up snakes with their hands. They will drink deadly poison. It will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. Not that, you know, individually we're going to do each of those, right? God has gifted us with certain gifts. But I'm just saying that, that, that we are to preach and we are to, in our belief, what's going to happen? You know, we're going to see demons driven out and, and, and the sick get well. And um, just amazing uh, miracles, right? God's going to protect us from danger. And so we have to remember that this 40 days between Jesus' resurrection um, and then his ascension to glory to go back to the Heavenly Father, you know, he's still training them. He's still getting them ready um, to then carry on Jesus' ministry um, when he is with the Father, right? They were going to need to depend on the Holy Spirit to fill them to go out, to obey Jesus, to go out and spread the good news. And that we know, if you were able to read Acts, um, uh, if, you, if you've read Acts before and you know history, that, 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 that these 11 disciples turned the world upside down, right? Christianity exploded in the first century through their ministry. And that was to fulfill what Jesus had said to them in Acts 1.8. He said, um, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So that came true. Um, so um, so I, what I'm trying to set up is I see three things that are spirit, that happen in the spiritual realm as we, um, not only for the disciples, but also for us as we um, depend on him. I think that, that, that we trust him, that there are things that Jesus does for us in the spiritual realm. And we need to be reminded of these things. And I think he's teaching them. This is what I'm going to do for you. So um, the first thing is um, when he was on the shore and the disciples were in the boat, right? It just it really immediately took me back to the story that we learned this year, um, that we saw this year with um, the disciples were out in the boat alone without Jesus. And the storm came up. Um, and Jesus was on the shore and he saw them and he walked out to them. He walked on the water. And, you know, of course, Peter was like, and Jesus, let me come, you know, let me come too. And he, as long as he kept his eyes fixed on Jesus, he walked on the water. But as soon as he put his eyes on the circumstances, he sunk, he began to sink. And Jesus immediately reached out, grabbed Peter. They got in the boat. The storm, um, storm went away. 
right? And so it just, it really made me think that, you know, this, that, that first point, the thing that Jesus always does for us um, is that he's going to protect us. He's going to watch over us, right? Lo, he says, I am with you always, right? This is a great promise from Jesus. We don't always feel like we're being protected, right? It, it, it sometimes things happen in life and, and maybe we're just, we're not really, you know, walking as closely with the Lord and we're learning, we're learning. We're always in a state of learning, right? We're always growing um, in our in our walk with God and in our spiritual understanding, right? But sometimes things happen and we don't feel like we're being protected. Um, we don't always see God at work in the spiritual realm, right? We don't, we, 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 well, I'm trying to learn to see him more in the spiritual realm. I don't see him in the spiritual realm that often. But, but, but just as, um, this was a story that um, one of our pastors just told, and, and forgive me for not knowing the details because I didn't go to the source to read it myself, but she was talking, and I don't know that she gave us me all the details. She didn't, I don't know, think that she gave all the details because um, she had just read it that morning. But so forgive me, but I think it was the missionary um, Smith Wigglesworth, his grandchild. So I want to put this his grandchild and the fa that family were going into the Congo as missionaries. Now, um, this probably, I'm guessing, is a about the turn of the century, 1900-ish, in that time period. And um, and, and, and this uh, grandchild of Smith Wigglesworth brought his whole family, or her whole family, I see, I don't even know if it's the mom or the dad, <laughs> um, to the Congo to go where no one had preached the gospel before. So they were going to a tribe that had never heard about Jesus. And they had three little kids, and this was days of traveling. And when they arrived to the village, um, they must have had a translator with them. When they arrived to the village, they were exhausted. They were tired. If you think traveling in America, we travel a whole day. You're so exhausted, right? But this was like way worse. It's still hard to travel in Africa, right? The roads are horribly bumpy. Roads, if you can call them roads, right? But 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 the mom was like, oh my gosh, I've got to put these kids to bed. I've got to put these kids to bed. And they were just so exhausted. Well, the, um, the tribe, uh, the, the chief, uh, pointed them to uh, that they were going to stay in this gazebo. And this was a, a gazebo-like structure that was in the middle of the village. And all the villagers had their own huts all around surrounding the gazebo-ish. I say gazebo because it was like a, a, a roof uh, on posts, but no sides. And, and they were just like, oh, okay, okay, they're so tired. They were just like, okay, we'll, figure, we'll, do, we'll sleep there tonight, but then we'll figure it out tomorrow kind of thing. So not much long after they went to bed, did this wicked storm whip out out of nowhere. Like they, they, the, they were uh, being um, uh, bombarded by uh, wind and rain and lightning and thunder. And the parents were praying. They were, because they had the three little kids, they're trying to sleep, nobody can sleep. It was very dangerous. Um, they're praying, you know, um, praying, please God, take them, you know, to protect them from the storm. And then they were like, Lord, in Jesus' name, uh, by the power and authority of, G of Jesus Christ, be still storm. You know, they were just, they were trying everything. They prayed all night long, all night long, but the storm would not be gone. The storm did not break until first thing in the morning. And these missionaries, they felt powerless. They felt like God wasn't answering their prayers. Um, they felt like failures. Like, how, why should these people listen to us? You know, kind of thing, right? Right? They felt defeated. Um, but um, the villagers came out in the morning, and they were shocked to see these missionaries that they had survived the night. And what they were stunned by was that the missionaries did not get eaten by the lions. They said that that every night the lions come by and every once in a while their kids will forget and a child will wander out of the hut and they will never be seen from again. The lions swoop them up and eat them. And, 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 and they came out of their tent huts not expecting to see them. And the, 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 the leader said, uh, they, the leader said, um, God, your God sent the storm to protect you from the lions. We want your God. 
<laughs> so that was just an amazing uh, revival in that in that camp. So I'm sure um, just like uh, the wiggle, you know, sometimes we don't feel provided. Sometimes things happen. We don't feel protected. Um, you know, I'm sh the wiggles, they did not, the, 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 uh, this missionary family did not uh, feel provided, you know, protected from the storm. And yet God was really protecting them from a greater danger. Well, I'm sure that, uh, and then likewise, the disciples probably, you know, when Jesus ascended to glory, uh, back with his heavenly father and the disciples were going out, I'm sure they did not feel always feel protected, right? I'm sure they had their moments um, because we know from reading Acts and from church history that the disciples were persecuted, they were imprisoned, um, they were hunted down, they were martyred for their faith, right? And Jesus was challenging them to um, see their circumstances with spiritual eyes, right? That our physical eyes can deceive us, but God is always at work. He's always working for our best interest, right? God, our Heavenly Father, He watches over us. He protects us, right? He provides for us greener pastures, right? We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. We will walk uh, to new heights of faith when we depend on Him, when we trust Him, right? And, and, and trust Him over our circumstances, right? Because with our physical eyes, we don't always see uh, what God is doing in the spiritual realm, but he's always at work in the spiritual realm for our good, right? We know that. Um, verse 10, um, Jesus said to them, uh, bring some of the fish you've caught. Well, Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was so full, full of fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come, have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and he took the bread and gave it to them and he did the same with the fish. Now this was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he had been raised from the dead. Well, the second point is that Jesus always provides for us and not only does he provide for us, he provides for us in abundance. The net was overflowing, right? He had the charcoal, the coal was already ready, the fish was already on the fire, the bread was made. I don't know if you've been able to see The Chosen yet. I love, we just started watching The Chosen a little while ago and uh, the love, the episode with the little children where they're like, oh, what's your favorite food? And Jesus said, I like bread. <laughs> I'm like, yes. He also said he liked cheese. I'm like, oh, I said to Jeff, oh, I could do the Jesus diet, right? Fish, bread, cheese, wine. This is great. What else? What, what more do you need? And Jeff's like, you know, it's only a TV show. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> Jesus provides for us in abundance as we abide with him. We know we are co-heirs with Christ. He's provided everything that we need, everything. He tells us everything that he has is ours too. And so if we find ourselves begging God for things, like if we're begging him uh, for provision or, or begging us to begging him to protect us but he's we're we're asking him for something that he's already supplied for us right we, we know this is all true of us um and i remember my pastor gave a, a this story uh about a year ago he said um when i go to my parents house he's like i don't go to their house and sit in their kitchen and like beg 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 oh mom dad please 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 can i have an apple please 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 can i have an apple you know, no, he said that would be insulting to them. They would be insulted, right? Because their attitude, son, all that I have is yours. So, so he, he, he says he goes into the fridge and he helps him politely, helps himself to what they have based on the authority that he is their child, the position that he has in the family. Right, and he doesn't say he didn't say with arrogance or presumption. We don't want to presume upon God. We don't want to be arrogant with God. We want to be thankful and grateful for all that He's provided. Right, but the truth is, Scripture says that we are adopted into God's family. Right, and we have all the rights and privileges that go with being God's child, and that's because of the authority that Jesus imparted to us. Every spiritual blessing in Christ, in Jesus' name, Amen. He's like, take eat, taste and see the Lord is good, right? We don't need to beg God for provision and protection, right? We just need to open our spiritual eyes and see that it's already been made available to us, right? Praise the Lord. We need to know, know he's at work in the heavenly realms and we need to walk in it. Well, the third thing 
um, we see also is empowered. We are empowered for ministry. You like that? That was Jeff. He's, he loves alliteration. <laughs> well, let's look at Peter. Uh, verse 15. Um, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than any of these? Yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, um, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Well, Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Well, there are some nuances here that help us to get the greater effect of what Jesus is doing. Um, and I'm sure there's more nuances than what I'm going to measure that I'm going to mention. Well, um, and, 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 and first off, what I want to say is that Jesus, and we miss, we miss it in the translation from the English to the English, you know, the English kind of misses what's go really going on. Um, so first off, Jesus uses Peter's old name. Now you remember from when early on in John, when Jesus called uh, Peter, he changed his name from pebble to rock. So when Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me? Um, he's like, pebble, do you love me? <laughs> right? Pebble. Right? And that was to remind Peter right, of his weakness, right, that, that, that he, that, of course, and, and, and the fact that he did it three times was, of course, that reminder of when he denied Jesus those three times, um, it was to remind him of his weaknesses, his failings, his shortcomings, right, but, but, but Jesus in the, is in the process of transforming Peter's character, right, and turning him into a great leader that he was going to become, a great leader in Christ. Oh my gosh, this is, I didn't write this down, but you know, my, my pastor just said something like, God looks at us through the eyes of faith. Like he sees what we will become, not who we are, but what we will become. That's how God sees us. I was like, oh, I just love to think about that. That was so cool. But anyway, so he's doing that with Peter, right? But Peter, Jesus was, was kind of like saying to him, you know, Peter, you're going to have to put off the old self, right? You're going to have to to confess, throw off the arrogance, the the impetuous, I can't say that word, <laughs> his impetuousness, uh his misunderstanding of spiritual things, um, his self-confidence, really, it's self-confidence, right? Peter was going to have to put that off, right, and get rid of that, right? Not that he would be perfect, because we know, uh, I'm sure you know, in Acts, if you read, you know, Peter's not perfect. He messes up again, um, and that's okay. Because, um, because Jesus, I think, is telling him, you know, as long as you remain teachable, teachable, humble, right? Be quick to repent, quick to confess, right? And be submissive to the Holy Spirit that's at work in you, transforming you. Like, with this attitude, Jesus can do a lot, do a lot through a man and a, and a woman that has that kind of attitude, right? They will be a great uh, spiritual leader, and that's what Jesus was doing in Peter. So Jesus asks, Peter, do you love me? But again, it gets lost in the translation, right? Because um, Greek has many different words for the word love. We have one, love. But the Greek has multiple words for love. So what Jesus is saying to Peter is, Peter, do you agape love me? Do you love me with the very love of God, that perfect unconditional, sold out, 100% love that only God can love with, right? That was what he was asking him. And, and, and when he says, do you love me more than these? That was also another little like, like we can kind of like, like assume. I mean, I hate assuming because it doesn't really say it, but we can kind of assume when he says, do you love me more than these? You know, probably Peter was a, probably at some point like boasting that he loved Jesus more than the disciples did. Probably, I don't know. I, I, again, I'm just guessing, but it was kind of, you know, 
oh, part of Peter's humbling, but, um, but, 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 you know, Peter, so Jesus is like, do you agape love me, Peter? And Peter's response was, yes, Lord, I brotherly love you, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's like not that full love. But Jesus knew that Peter did not have the ability in his flesh, in his humanness. Humans cannot love with that agape love, right? Um, unless they're filled with the Holy Spirit and they learn to love by faith. Um, because in our flesh, right, we cannot. And, and Peter asks uh, the second time and a third time. And, and as he's asking the second time and the third time, right, you sense Peter's uh, frustration elevating. And the third time, Jesus actually says, do you love me with brotherly love, Peter? And, and, and we know that, you know, I, I think that, you know, Jesus is saying to Peter, you're right, Peter, you cannot love me with agape love yet, right? But you can love with all, like, in your flesh, you can't love with that agape love. But you do love me with as much human love as you possibly can muster. And Peter, you know, in his res response, you know, is kind of like, Yes, Lord, you know that, you know, you know my heart, Lord, you know my heart, you know me better than I know myself, right? And that's a right place to be. And I think at that point, Jesus is like, okay, Peter, I can work with that. Let's go, right? It was time, it's showtime, right? Not showtime, but you know, let's go. Uh, things are going to get fun and interesting. I think at this point, Peter, um, he was already privately uh, reinstated by Jesus. I think Jesus had appeared to him in a private moment where um, Peter did business with Jesus, right? He asked him for forgiveness. Jesus fully forgave him. They reconciled and he was reinstated um, privately. But this was a public uh, reinstatement. And I think it wasn't only good for Peter to do this, even though it was humbling, it probably hurt, um, hurt him. Um, right to be humbled and of course Jesus did not have any um, you know bad motives in humbling um, uh, 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 in humbling Peter right but um, but I think in a way um, Jesus was um, showing the disciples right that Peter was fully forgiven right that his sins were remembered no more and that he's been fully reconciled to Jesus and he's been fully reinstated for the ministry that Jesus has for him. We know that Jesus, again, he was being molded by Jesus because of his humble attitude, right? And, and God's will for his life. He was working with God to mold him to be a great leader in the church. He would be their leader, right? They would look to him. Um, and, and, and Jesus was getting ready to do great miracles in and through, through them. And I think that, that just having that demonstration of that humble submission and that repented heartedness, um, that that's what God wants, that teachableness, that we need to stay teachable. Um, and, and, and so again, Peter's forgiven, sins no longer uh, remembered, um, that Peter was going to run that race that Jesus had marked out for him, right? Unencumbered by sin. Um, and he was going to um, teach and lead the church fully forgiven and fully free, right? Because he's in Christ and he's going to elaborate to the church and what that means because, and he could teach on God's love and he could teach on God's grace because he experienced it firsthand, right? And that's another Thing that we don't want to uh, miss as we see this passage, right? That we too, we are to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? We are to serve him by loving others, right? And sometimes we have to love others by faith. Sometimes people, we can't do it in our own humanness. Sometimes, right? We got to depend on the Holy Spirit to fill us, the power of the Holy Spirit by faith, to love and serve others. We need to walk in love. That's a big principle here. We need to always be walking in God's love. And again, we can't always, we're just the vessels. We need to release control to God, humbly submit to him, acknowledging him that we cannot love with his love, 
fully, right? We need to trust him to love others through us, right? And so Peter, we know, is genuinely repentant. And I love this about Peter because he didn't stay in his sorrow. He didn't become self-focused and woe is me and look at my weaknesses, look at my shortcomings. I can't do anything for Christ, right? No pity party, right? He got up. Jesus, he allowed Jesus to pick him up, excuse me, and run the race to press on for the purposes that God had for him to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, when I see feed my sheep in a nutshell, and again, I wish I had more time, I, I think about being wholly devoted to Jesus, right? To being in his word all the time. And we know from John 1, 1, Jesus is the word, right? So to remain in the teaching of God's word, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to allow the Holy Spirit to, to teach you, to give you spiritual understanding as you read the word, to abide in Jesus, and that wherever God will take you, that by words and by actions, right, we are to take Jesus to wherever um, God would have us go, uh, right? And so we want to be an example of being abiding in Christ and um, and living the word and loving the word and teaching the word wherever we go um, so that others will desire to have that deeper understanding, that deeper awareness of how to know Christ and um, and to know God and um, and again to be um, to be um, to believe and receive, um, because we know that, you know, the flesh, the flesh, the word made flesh dwelt among them and dwelt, dwelt among us and lives within us. Well, verse 19, um, just to, um, uh, to reaffirm that um, even through Peter's sufferings, he was going to glorify God. I'm going to say, I'm going to come back to that in a second. But uh, verse 20, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. We assume that was John following them. And um, Lord, um, oh, and um, when Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what, ab oh, what about him? Okay, I know I'm going to die for you. I'm going to glorify you through my death. But what about, what about him? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is it to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die, but Jesus did not say he wouldn't die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I re return, what is it to you, right? And so interesting, you know, you kind of get that sense that, okay, the flesh isn't fully killed, right? Because you got that rivalry going, and we've seen shadows of that rivalry um, in, in the Gospels, right? And, 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 um, by the way, um, in watching The Chosen, so it's interesting because we know John, if you read the God, when we read the Gospel of John, we studied the Gospel of John this year. If you read his letters, go on to read his letters. He is called the disciple of love for a reason. I mean, John just gushes God's love everywhere, right? And so my daughter, Nikki, my 17-year-old, like she only knows the, the love the love disciple she only knows the love john and then we're watching the chosen and 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 they did an episode on Th sons of thunder like john and jane his brother james were called jesus called them thuns sons of thunder and nikki got really wide-eyed and she like looked over at me and she's like ma was john really like that <laughs> like it really shocked her and i said oh yes of course he was but Jesus changed him. What an amazing testimony of a life transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ alive in John, fully submitted to Jesus, changed him, changed his character, made him more like Jesus. Praise the Lord. And, and when you think about it, right, Jesus took John. John and Peter were two totally different men. They had totally different personalities. They had different gifts. And yet Jesus united them in the spirit right in, in christ um and they worked together and they brought in uh at this point james uh jesus's brother james did not believe him until he until james saw his risen brother and that's when he believed and the three of them uh jesus's brother james peter john they formed this uh triad of spiritual leadership right and they were called pillars in the early church but anyway, back to 19, where Peter would suffer for Christ. 
Um, and that's one of the themes in Peter's let letters, like through our weaknesses, through our sufferings, through our shortcomings, God will use those to bring victory, victory in the kingdom, right? When, when, he, when, we, when he, we allow him to mold us and use us by Jesus's power and by his authority, right? Great things are happening in the heavenly realms. And, 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 and Peter said in um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us everything for new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation. This is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief of all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by the fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus is revealed. Well, praise the Lord. He's going to use our sufferings after a little while. I love that. Even if you suffer your whole life in the realm of eternity, in the scheme of eternity, compared to eternity, it's only a little while, right? That Jesus would use. He wants to use our suffering and our weaknesses and our failings and our shortcomings for God's glory. He will always do that. Well, what was John's aim this year, right? That we would believe, that we would receive, and that we would find life in him, right? And, and we know that from John 17, verse uh, uh, 3, that this is eternal life. Jesus said that they might know uh, God the Father and Jesus the Son. So we are to abide in him. We are to remain connected to him. He's the vine. We are the branches, right? We are, we are um, fused with Jesus in an inseparable union, right? And we, the branches that Jesus is going to, we are safe. We are secure in the vine. We are protected. He also provides for us everything we need abundantly as the vine provides for uh, the branch, everything the branch needs to grow and produce fruit, right? We are provided for in abundance. Our new life in Christ brings new hope. We are new creations. There's a new joy. There's a new peace. There's a, a, a higher quality of life that this new joy and this new peace and this new love brings that the world cannot understand, right? Christ alive within us gives us a new mission, right? In life, we have new values, new goals, new aspirations as we grow in what it means to know Christ, right? Well, life is not always gonna be easy, right? In the physical, we have things come against us, but what have we learned this year? Nothing, nothing that comes at me is bigger than my God. My God is bigger than anything that can come my way, right? And he has already overcome it. Praise the Lord, Jesus has already overcome our circumstances. And as we learn to walk in the spirit, right? We want to see our circumstances um, in our, through our spiritual eyes. We get our spiritual vision through the word of God and being filled with the spirit as we understand the word of God. I will see victory in all things. God works for our good and for his glory. It's not going to always be easy, but remember these 11 turned the world upside down through the ministry that God had called them to. And it was not for them all rainbows and unicorns, right? We talked about their sufferings, but they also had to deal with real people that had real sufferings, that, that had real challenges in life, right? And that needed real healing, the healing that only Jesus can supply. Well, wow. Uh, verse 24, this is the disciple who testifies these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Right? Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have a, enough room for the books that will be written. Wow, I want to know everything that Jesus said. I want to know everything that Jesus did, right? We will know someday. But in the meantime, we need to walk in the blessing of being in Christ, right? Jesus said in the previous chapter, verse 25, I'm sorry, 29, Jesus said, blessed are those who have not yet seen but believe. You are blessed. You are blessed. You, you need to go in the, I don't mean to be so pushy, <laughs> but go in the power and the authority that Jesus has bestowed upon you. Walk in the blessing that is already yours. Walk in the victory that Jesus has already secured for you, right? That comes with knowing that you are in Christ. In Christ, you have everything you need for life and godliness. Amen.